Hi, I'm Saul Levmore. I'm a professor of law and economics at the University of Chicago, and it's my good fortune to introduce you to the subject of economics. Well, what is economics? Let's play a game of free association. I say economics, you say whatever comes to mind. Economics, money, economics, Wall Street, housing bubble, prices, incentives. Ooh, if you said incentives, that's pretty sophisticated. I think it's easy to see why economics is relevant. Economics is everywhere. Economics is why buildings go up. Economics is why cookies cost $3. Economics is about getting the seat you want on a plane. Economics is, yeah, it's about making money, but it's about human behavior in general. Economics is to the real world around you as meteorology is to the weather. It's interpreting all the phenomena and figuring out if there's anything we can do about them. Economics is, formally at least, the study of the allocation of scarce resources. You don't have enough of something, a lot of people want it, who gets it, how do they get it, what do they give for it, how do you get people to make more of the thing, all of that is economics. Economics likes to assume, just to make its job easier, that people are rational. You know, what, what is a rational person? The rational man is the guy who sees that the price of wheat rises, he gets up earlier in the morning and grows more wheat on his farm. The guy who buys more of something when the price drops. That's the rational man. The rational man loves to download stuff from iTunes when iTunes price goes down. But the rational man also creates more music in his garage and sells it when he gets paid more by people who download it from iTunes. One guy wants the price low, one guy wants the price high. They're using incentives to communicate with one another. Economics is also about puzzles. And these puzzles, or even deep mysteries, have a lot to do with how economics got started in the first place. Kings would be really confused about some things. They would issue new coins, the coins would go out into the realm, and the coins would disappear. Where were these coins going? Peter the Great beheaded some thousand people for hoarding coins, and he could never figure out why when he issued silver coins, People would hide them or bury them in the fields. Why didn't they want to use these coins? What was so great about holding them? How come countries traded some things and not others? England and Portugal were sending wine and cheese back and forth, but some things never seemed to travel. You know, why was that? Well, out of these puzzles came the study of economics, and the people who advised these kings can be thought of as the first economists. And economists have continued to like puzzles ever since. Two of the things we're going to focus on today are prices and the form of competition. And let me say a little bit about them before we get there. Prices are these things that tell people how much something costs, how much they have to sacrifice to buy it, how important it is to make more of the thing. We're going to see a lot of prices today. By form of competition, I mean the people who make these things are they competing with other firms to make it, or are they the only one out there making it? When they're the only one out there, we call them a monopolist. And we're going to spend a good deal of our time today understanding what's so interesting about monopolies, why governments care about them, why governments sometimes even like monopolies, and why you and I might not like them so much. Prices and competition, or its opposite, monopolies, are two central tools in the study of economics. These are the tools that we're going to be looking to use to solve problems. We want to understand the recent financial crisis that hit the world. We want to understand housing bubbles. We're going to start with prices. We're going to start with competition. And then we're going to understand the role of the government. So let's start with prices. Prices do everything. Prices tell oil companies when to dig deeper for oil. Prices tell me when to fly. Prices tell me when to fill my car with gas. Prices tell me whether to go to a restaurant early or go to the restaurant late. And in fact, when the restaurant doesn't offer price differentials, I'm a little disappointed. Sometimes on a rainy day, I think, boy, I bet there's nobody going out to the restaurant now. I wish the restaurant would drop the price, and then I'd be more eager to go to the restaurant. So sometimes we have prices and sometimes we don't. But when we have them, they're a little bit like magic. Now, this magic can be a little bit puzzling, and indeed, prices have puzzled economists for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. You know, why do things cost what they do? You know, say I you know, eat a chocolate chip cookie. Why does that cookie cost a dollar? 
Well, first let's see the puzzle associated with it. You might be inclined to say, well, a really good cookie costs more, people really like it. Well, you might say the more important the thing is, the more it costs. If I say a house costs $300,000 and a cookie costs a dollar, why does the house cost more than a cookie? Your initial response might be, well, people need houses more, the cookie's a luxury, therefore the house costs more. But that, that's not really a successful way to think about it. Think of the following classic example, air. Air is basically free. And then things like a diamond are classically super expensive. Economists used to say, why is a diamond more expensive than a breath of air? Well, you already know the answer. The answer, you should say, is scarcity. There are very, very few diamonds. You have to dig deep in the ground to get the diamond, transport it thousands of miles, polish it, cut it, do this, do that. It's a lot of work. It's very hard to get them. There aren't many of them. Air, it's available. You just breathe it in. Well, let's go back to cookies and houses now. That's a little bit more complicated. Let's do cookies first. I love a good cookie. Imagine that I would pay $10 for a really fantastic, juicy chocolate chip cookie. Now, I never have paid $10 for a cookie, even though I would. So if I go to a bakery, even my favorite bakery, and I walk in and I say, oh, how much are those fantastic cookies? The baker knows that I would pay $10 for the cookie. He can see it all over my face, but he says, well, that cookie's $3. Why doesn't he charge me $10? I mean, he might check out my face when I walk in and charge $10. But of course, if he did that, I would just go out to the sidewalk, I'd wait there, I'd wait for somebody else to go into the bakery and buy the cookie for $3, they would come out, and I'd give them $3.05 or something for the cookie. So sometimes we say the baker is unable to price discriminate among, among people. Well, that doesn't answer the question of why the cookie costs $3. So imagine the cookie sells for $5. The baker sees there's some people who really want the cookie. Baker starts raising his price, charging $5. What's the next thing that will happen? Well, other people will see, you can make a lot of money running a bakery. Just gather together chocolate chips, rent an oven, get some flour, get the other ingredients necessary for making chocolate chip cookies, and you'll start making cookies, and the price will start dropping as more and more people offer cookies. They'll undercut one another, $4.50, 4 $3.99, until the price goes down to, well, to the amount that it'll cost that marginal bakery to produce that chocolate chip cookie. In the short run, if there's a lot of demand for the cookie, the price might rise. If suddenly 100 people like me rush into the store and say we all want the cookie, Maybe the baker can raise the price a little bit in order to allocate the cookies that are there. But if that keeps happening, new bakers will enter the industry. Bakeries will be popping up all up and down the street, and cookies will drop to $3, which is the cost of producing them. So prices of inputs are signaling the baker how to make the cookies. The price of the cookie is signaling me about buying the cookie, and my desire for the cookie is bringing new competitors into the industry. In the long run, the price of that cookie will be the cost of combining the inputs. Let's compare it to that house. Say you have a house selling for $300,000. Well, what does that mean? It means that builders trying to put together windows and bricks and doors and roofs and sub-zero refrigerators or whatever goes into the house, they put all those things together and maybe there's great demand for housing. Maybe incomes have risen. Maybe a war has come to an end. Maybe somebody can sell that house for $500,000. If so, New building contractors will come in, just like bakers came into that previous market. They'll start selling more houses, they'll build houses, they'll work overtime, and they'll build houses and build houses, and the price of housing will drop again until, in equilibrium, we say, that marginal builder can produce a house just like that for $300,000. Price won't drop any further because, by assumption, no builder can show up and put together those inputs for less than $300,000. Prices are little messengers that run back and forth. When the price of the house went up to $500,000, it was as if messengers had run out and said to builders, quick, work overtime, build more houses. They said to the brick kilns, produce more bricks. When the price started dropping, imagine a lot of empty houses all over the place. Messengers will run around and say, houses are now selling for $300,000 or less because there's a glut of houses. Builders won't get up in the morning to build houses. No need to pound that hammer if you're not going to get paid for it. The same thing for the baker. The prices run back and forth telling the bakeries when to produce more cookies, when to produce fewer cookies, when to open new stores, and so forth. 
So in the long run, the answer to the question of, gee, why is that house more expensive than that cookie? The answer to that is that in the long run, that's the cost of the inputs of putting those things together. It just costs more for the earth, in a sense, to produce the house than to produce the cookie. Economists like to use the word demand to refer to the consumer side of the transaction. How much do people want the cookie? How much do people want the new houses? Prices are probably the best way of measuring the intensity with which people prefer something. The more people would pay, the more the good was in demand. What we saw, though, was that in the long run, for competing objects like cookies in a bakery, houses on the housing market, in the long run, it was the cost of supplying them that mattered the most. But there are exceptions to this. Imagine a trendy, fashionable handbag. The cost of a designer putting together this handbag might really be $40, but the handbag might sell for 10 times that. Now, that's a kind of exceptional market, and it's worth thinking about what's going on there. There are knockoffs, of course, and the very same designer could produce more handbags. But in the short run, the designer seems to have figured out that selling this handbag for $400, way above the cost of the inputs, that is, the cost of assembling the handbag, somehow triggers a market. The higher price, in this sense, seems to attract people to the good for a while because it's a fashion trend or a signal to them that this is a hot item to buy. There are people who want to carry this handbag because it's unique. Or there are people who maybe who are even signaling, look, I can afford a $400 handbag. Same thing with sneakers. You know, I have boring running shoes and even more boring shoes, and I pay, you know, maybe $80 for them. All around me, I see colorful, trendy footwear that's actually cheaper to assemble, just a canvas and a rope, practically, but that costs much more money than that. Again, why is that? Well, that's the demand side, that there's a short-term fashion trend, in a way, where people really want the thing, thousands of it are made, they need to be allocated, they're allocated by the price mechanism. The higher price, in this sense, seems to attract people to the good for a while, because it's a fashion trend or a signal to them that this is a hot item to buy. Again, that doesn't last long. There could be a bubble for something like sneakers. The price could go way, way, way up before more sneakers flood the market or the fashion goes out. I don't think you'll ever find a bubble for chocolate chip cookies. You know, that is basically based on the cost of assembling the cookie, and many, many other people can enter the industry and produce the cookie and drive the price down. It's hard to imagine a sustainable bubble for cookies. Handbags, some kinds of housing, certainly sneakers, they can be sold for a period of time at above the cost of putting them together, and it's something we need to keep track of. Let's think about the recent housing bubble we experienced. I think we all have the same picture, which is housing prices were going up and up. People were borrowing more and more money on these houses. Banks, perhaps, were too free to lend money, giving people mortgages on houses that might not have been so valuable. And eventually, the housing market collapsed. People were left holding houses that really weren't worth the amount of money they had borrowed. People were walking away from the mortgages. Banks were in trouble. There was colossal financial failure. Big Wall Street firms were in trouble. The government thought it had to step in, and so forth. How could such a housing bubble occur? If economics is so good, if these prices are these clever little messengers I've described, why didn't these messengers do their job? Why didn't they run back and forth and say, whoa, the price is too high, don't buy housing, don't construct more. Instead, we have people all over the country building houses, even though houses are now decaying empty in Nevada, California, Florida, and elsewhere. Something went wrong, and maybe economists are to blame. First, let me defend economists. You might say, how could economists not see the housing bubble? Economists are no better at predicting future fads than meteorologists are at predicting the weather next year, or physicists are at predicting where I'll be in two weeks. Economists are very, very good at knowing if the price of wheat goes up now, here's what will happen tomorrow. And they're very good at some long-term forecasting, too. But knowing what will happen in the long run in a housing market turns out to be very complicated. One reason it's complicated is that people are not just buying houses to live in them. They're buying houses as an investment. They're buying houses because they're afraid that if they don't buy a house, the house will go up in value and they won't be able to afford the same house later on. They are, in a sense, speculating in housing, even as they're also living in it. It's very tricky to figure out people's speculation because it's about their psychology of everyone thinking prices are going up, I better buy, buy, buy now. And that's what we mean by a bubble. 
We mean that people are afraid to stay out of the market because they're afraid prices will rise. So they buy the item in question, or they see everyone else making money, they think I'll make money too. But then the price ends up having little to do with their actual demand for the product, that is their actual preference for it, and certainly has very little to do with the actual cost of assembling the inputs. Some people have faith that governments can intervene and control these bubbles. You know, in the housing case, the government did not see the bubble coming any more than the private market saw it coming. So there's a lot of disagreement there among economists about whether governments are part of the problem or part of the solution in bubbles. Again, though, that's something you need to study in the future because we can't afford too many bubbles in your lifetime. A couple Thanksgivings ago, I was sitting on a packed airplane. I was lucky enough to have an aisle seat. Sitting next to me was a really nice, tall, very tall student named Todd, and we chatted a little bit. And he asked me, listen, how about trading seats with me for 50 bucks? You know, I'm a really big guy. I'm six foot eight. These middle seats cramp me. I really, really want an aisle seat. So every time I get on a plane, I'm in a middle seat. I try to bargain with the person next to me to get the aisle seat so I can stretch out my legs. 50 bucks? I said, sure. Now think about Todd a little bit and the study of economics. We saw that economics is about the allocation of scarce resources. Well, the scarce resource is the aisle seat. There are fewer aisle seats than people who want them. Now, also, there's no market. Todd wishes there had been a big market out there where you got on the plane or you got on your computer and you saw which seats were available and which seat you want and you could bid for your seat. Todd apparently was willing to pay $50 to get an aisle seat but at least so far, no airline is saying, oh, you can move to the aisle seat if you give me $47.80. So Todd was trying to create the market on his own. Of course, it's a complicated market. In a sense, he had to create two markets. He had to sell his middle seat and buy an aisle seat. Now, people do that on Wall Street, and they make hundreds of millions of dollars. On Wall Street, we call it arbitrage. They look for things that they think are mispriced, where you can make money by selling one thing and buying another thing and maybe doing them backwards and forwards many, many times in a day. That's in a way what Todd was trying to do, except he didn't have a well-developed market. Todd wished there had been these markets, but instead he had to make them. He was trying to arbitrage middle seats and aisle seats. So we've been talking about cookies and about houses, and they are sold in competitive markets. By competitive markets, I don't mean anything complicated just that there are many buyers and sellers running around trying to service one another, get the business, buy the thing at a lower price, and all that. Those markets are the foundation of economics. Economists spend a lot of time on competitive markets. But not everything is sold in a competitive market, and maybe less so than ever. For example, nonprofits occupy the healthcare field. Nonprofits are important in education. Nonprofits are important in supplying goods to poor people and so forth. Governments are not competitive firms. They're either monopolists or something else. Governments supply a lot. They supply national defense and firefighting and national parks and schools and this and that. And then there are also monopolists. Monopolists, again, are single sellers, traditionally. They have a market all to themselves. Think about all the monopolists that we know. Uh, iPads are sold in monopoly markets because Apple has patents on critical aspects of the iPad. Let's examine those prices and messenger systems a little bit more carefully by thinking at the same time of an example where the airline is now not a competitor, where many, many airlines are flying. But let's now begin to introduce the idea of the monopolist, that is the seller who does not face competition, but is the only one selling these seats. Let's try an example together. Do you remember Todd on the airplane? Imagine that Todd was flying on a plane and to make the example as simple as possible, imagine the plane was owned by an airline called Big Air, for lack of a better name, and that Big Air was the only carrier flying between the two cities Todd and I were traveling. Say it was Boston to LaGuardia Airport in New York. So I have a chart here. I've, of course, made it up, but it's a pretty realistic chart in a way. And it shows that as Big Air charges more and more for a seat on the airline, fewer people will want to travel on big air. Either they won't travel to New York or they'll drive, take the train, walk, donkey, what have you. But let's have a look at it. If they charge $50 a seat, 10,000 people will want to fly to New York that day. Wow. If they charge $5,000 a seat, basically no one wants to go. 10 spoiled snobs will fly. And there, there you go on the bottom. $5,000 price, 10 seats. 
Big Air will collect $50,000. And then in the more realistic range, at a price of $300, we see that 2,000 people will demand seats, that is, want to accept the offer to travel from Boston to New York on Big Air at that price on that day. And so if it sells 2,000 tickets at $300 each, Big Air will collect $600,000 in revenue. I haven't said anything about their costs yet. If it raises the price more to $500, well, it gets a lot of people. A thousand of those 2,000 people will still want to pay for the seat, and they'll pay $500, but of course, a thousand people will then not fly. So I've constructed the example so that Big Air takes in the most money when it charges $300. It's not free for Big Air to fly to New York. It has costs. And as we know, these costs are very, very important in figuring out you know, when to fly, how to fly, and what to charge. Well, I think of Big Air charging just $50, that sort of crazy low price, 10,000 people wanting to travel. We know that Big Air would have taken in $500,000 in revenue. Well, what does it cost Big Air to fly 10,000 people? And I've put in some huge number. You know, imagine that it costs an average of $300 a person, which would be $3 million to fly so many people. Why does it cost more rather than less per seat when it wants to fly more and more people? Well, to a degree, when you start increasing the number of seats, that is, you increase production or output, as we call it, to a degree, costs drop. You know, think about the pilot flying the plane. If you only have one passenger on the plane and you've got to pay the pilot, say, $1,000 a day to fly the plane, then that $1,000 is borne entirely by that one customer sitting in seat 1A. You put 10 customers on the plane, same pilot, the pilot's salary can now be spread among 10 customers. So that relatively fixed cost of the pilot, that fixed cost drops, or it becomes a less important part of price, as we have more and more customers. When Big Air increases the number of passengers from 10 to 1,000 by dropping the price from 5,000 to 500, it gets what we sometimes call economies of scale. It's able to spread the pilot cost and the airplane cost and the landing cost and all those things I mentioned among more and more people. And so the average cost of sending someone to New York drops, in this case, from $3,000 to $200. Notice it stays there for a while, and then it rises once they go to 10,000 seats. And why might that be? Well, they'd probably run out of landing rights at LaGuardia. I mean, where would you land 10,000 people a day more than the system now holds? Well, now if we put these two charts together, we can see how Big Air would make the most amount of money. That's usually its job. We say that firms are trying to maximize profits. Again, we imagine the firm as a rational player that has a goal. And in this case, its goal is to make as much money as possible. Well, look at the example. When it charges $50 and those 10,000 people fly, Big Air loses money. It spends $3 million, but we saw that it takes in revenue of only $50 a seat times 10,000 seats is $500,000. It loses $2.5 million. Big Air never wants to do that. What about $300 a seat? Well, that, that's pretty good for Big Air. As you can see, it yields a $200,000 profit. Big Air can even do better if it charges $500 a seat, even though it only costs Big Air $200 to fly the person. We can see that here is where it maximizes its profits, hauling in $300,000 in net profit. Think about Big Air's price structure there. It was able to supply the seat for $200, and yet it figured out that it should charge $500. From Big Air's point of view, if it tries to drop the price from $500 to $300, in a way you might think, well, how could that be a bad thing? They're gonna take in 1,000 more customers who are willing to pay $300 a seat for the privilege of flying, when it only costs Big Air $200 a seat to supply the airplane seats. So, of course, you'd think Big Air would make more money by lowering the price to $300. Indeed, any price it can charge above $200, it can make money. Cost me $200 to make the seat, I charge you $212, I chalk up another $12 in profit. But Big Air in this example is a monopolist. Big Air is the only one flying. And so Big Air sees and says to itself, well, wait a minute. If we drop the price from $500 to $300 in order to capture those extra people, we're giving up charging $500 to the first 1,000 people we flew. And it's not worth losing $200,000 from those more intense, desired, inframarginal customers, if you will, in order to make $100,000 from the new 1,000 people who will pay $300 a seat when it costs $200 a seat to fly them. So Big Air instead chooses, nope, we will restrict output, we say, and fly at $500 a seat, selling just 1,000 seats rather than 2,000 seats. 
from a social point of view, think about it from the outside, or even from the government's point of view, or the citizenry point of view, this is really a shame. After all, the cost of the resources of flying somebody to New York is apparently $200. And there are people out there willing to spend more than $200. Think of it as a resource ecology thing. The cost of the resources on Earth are such that for $200, you could fly another person from point A to point B. And there's somebody out there willing to spend $300 for it. That person has an intense preference compared to the actual cost of doing it. But we deny them the flights. We say, no, no. Because I'm a monopolist and I can make more money at $500, I don't want to sell it to you at $300. Economists call this a deadweight loss. They say, boy, that's a shame. There should be somebody, there is somebody willing to supply the seat at a tad over $200, even $300 in our example, and there's somebody who wants to pay $300 for it, and yet we're not matching them up. Now, you've already seen that if this was a competition, if there were 10 airlines out there flying, of course, another airline like my cookie maker would jump right in there and say, oh, come here, come here, we'll fly into New York. Give us $300, we can fly you for $200. It's a great deal. But again, because Big Air is a monopolist, it's the only one flying this route, and the demand structure, the prices are as we've seen, Big Air will choose to restrict output to sell only 1,000 seats at $500 a seat. Now, in the real world, they can have it both ways. If you fly on an airline and you talk to the person next to you, you might find that they've paid much more than you paid for your seat, or much less than you've paid for your seat. Big Ed does not quite have to charge everybody the same for its chocolate chip cookie, if you will. There is an ability for it to control arbitrage. Now, in this case, it does it by saying, your ticket is non-refundable and non-transferable. You can't sell it back to us and just buy another ticket when the prices drop. And similarly, you can't just go to the airport and trade it with other people. And they do this maybe hiding behind a false claim about security or identification or something. I mean, it's not entirely obvious why we let them do that. But for the time being, they can do that. And this allows them to discriminate in a way. That's not meant as a terribly bad word here. It's a word economists use to differentiate among customers. They are able to take the people who want to pay a lot of money and charge them a little bit more and take the people who want to pay close to the $200 and charge them less. So in real life, Big Air discriminates among customers. You've probably also figured out by now that that decreases rather than increases the deadweight loss. After all, it makes it more likely that Big Air is selling seats that it can make for $200 to people who are willing to pay more than $200 for them. Because it's already sold seats to the $500 people, and then it's able to lower the price without people conducting arbitrage and trading the seats. So price discrimination by a monopolist allows it to make more money also decreases the deadweight loss, though it might get us a little nervous for other reasons. After all, the monopolist is now gonna make much, much more money, and there might be people who don't like that, or we might worry that the monopolist is setting markets up on purpose in order to price discriminate. Notice that the monopolist doesn't necessarily get to keep all this money. The more clever the monopolist, the more clever the government. I guess a good government could take this money away if it wanted to. A government might say, well, to the extent that we are giving you the monopoly, after all, we're the one that's deciding how many planes can land in LaGuardia. Instead of selling all those landing rights to Big Air, the government could have set things up so that Big Air would have competed with American Airlines, United Airlines, and so forth. So if the government gives or allows Big Air this monopoly, the government might say, well, we want to tax away a good deal of that money or price it away in order to use the money for public works or to build LaGuardia or to expand the runway or what have you. Well, it's easy to see how the government does that. The government might auction off the landing rights. The government might say, well, we're willing to sell the right to fly 10 planes a day to LaGuardia. Let's see how much you all will pay for it. So when you see a monopoly price discriminate, don't immediately think that the monopoly is making all that money. There might be somebody, and especially the government, that's able to extract a good deal of that profit through an auction or a taxing uh, scheme. The reason I put the example that way is I wanted to introduce the idea that for monopoly to thrive, it needs to have a way of preventing competitors from entering the market. Sometimes we say that monopolies thrive where there are barriers to entry. It has to be something that keeps the competitors out. In the cookie case, nothing kept out new bakeries. And so as soon as the price of cookies started rising, more people entered the market and started producing those wonderful chocolate chip cookies. In the case of Big Air, it's the landing rights at LaGuardia that are the barrier to entry. 
If the government doesn't have any more to offer, or whoever, the port authority that owns LaGuardia only sells off a certain amount, that's a barrier to entry that prevents other firms from entering. iPad has patents. Uh, movies have copyright. Lawyers have some licenses. Doctors have some licenses. Everywhere we look, where there's some monopoly power, there are some barriers to entry. And do you see what all these examples have in common? It's that the government, the law, plays a very, very big role in either creating or sustaining these barriers to entry. Indeed, we might say that while it's true that monopolies thrive because of barriers to entry, that's what keeps the competitors out, the barriers to entry themselves either require government complicity or come about because of government complicity. In our modern world, Big Air has a funny business. It knows that it needs the government to sustain its monopoly. It needs those landing rights at LaGuardia not to be sold to other airlines. And so, Big Air's most important business might not be serving airline snacks, it might not be training pilots, it might not be learning about metal fatigue, it might actually be about learning how to get along with government. After all, an important part of its business is retaining its monopoly, getting those landing rights at the best available prices, and maintaining them against competition. Big Air is in the business of seeking help from the government. It's not something we like to say in a capitalist society, but it is something that's true. At the same time, the government, which is to say our politicians, finds itself in the business of wanting to do business with Big Air. Think about the typical government official. The government official needs to get reelected. They need campaign financing. They need money. Big Air is a natural for contributing to campaigns. Big Air wants its monopoly. The government politicians want money to run campaigns. This is a match made in heaven, or at least in the skies. Sometimes in economics, we call this rent seeking. The idea refers to the fact that businesses need to spend resources in order to get in the position where they have the monopoly power. There is this rent they want, the monopoly profit. They want that extra money that can only come by being a monopolist, but they have to spend money to get there. And as we're about to see in the extreme case, they might spend so much money to get that the monopolist that they're really not much of a monopolist at all. And let's see how that might happen. Now in middle school, they taught you, and they taught me too, that governments are perfect. That the government knows that it needs to do what's good for the citizenry. If the government does a bad job, the voters will kick the government out of office and get themselves some new politicians. Well, in that world, the government will decide where it wants monopolies. It might decide, oh, having only one firm land at LaGuardia is a good idea, or we need to encourage inventors, let's have patents. Post office is a good thing. Other areas, it might decide a monopoly is a bad thing. The government might do what is in the best interest of the economy, which is to say the citizens at large. But you know, we're not in middle school anymore. And now we know that government politicians have their own incentives. And part of their incentives is to get more money in campaign donations. Part of their job is to look for jobs for themselves and their relatives after they're out of office. In this kind of world, the government cannot necessarily be relied on to do what's good for its citizens. And so it's a good idea for us to keep track of what's in it for big air, what's in it for the government, and see how the two work together. Think about this. Someone sitting in the White House who runs for re-election might spend these days a billion dollars getting re-elected, a billion dollars. And his opponents will probably spend about the same amount competing for the right to run against him and then running against him. That's two billion dollars in resources spent on the voters. It's very unlikely that a big part of that two billion dollars is giving us information that we cannot otherwise get from newspapers and other sources. So that's a kind of waste. That is, people competing for our votes or competing for attention might compete with one another in a kind of arms race where they spend and spend and spend in order to outdo one another. And actually, there's a lot of waste involved. The same thing is true on the other side. When Big Air and its competitors compete to get these landing rights at LaGuardia, or somebody competes for the right to build a bridge across the Mississippi River, they too might compete with each other. And they might compete so much as to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that's what we want to turn to next, to see how rent-seeking can be destructive. Politicians spending on a campaign would be monopolists spending for the right to get the monopoly, and countries going to war can all be thought of in one economic model. Economists sometimes call this a pay-all auction. And think of the following metaphor. Imagine an auction in which 
uh, I bid $10, you bid $12, she bids $14, going, 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 she gets it. We call that a standard auction, or if you want to be fancy, an English auction. It goes to the highest bidder, the highest bidder pays the amount bid, and the highest bidder then gets that amount. There are many other kinds of auctions. In a pay-all auction, I bid 10, you bid 12, she bids 14, maybe I bid 16, then I get it for 16, but she has to pay 14 and you have to pay the 12. That is, it's pay all. Everybody needs to pay the amount of his or her highest bid. Same thing with a campaign. You spend a lot of money on your campaign, I run against you, and I spend a lot of money running against you. One of us wins, none of us gets our money back. It's not like a standard auction where if you lose, at least you don't have to pay. Let's imagine Big Air participating in an auction in order to get its monopoly in the first place. We already know that Big Air can make a lot of money if it's the only one flying from Boston to LaGuardia, but it has to acquire those landing rights. And imagine that the government is auctioning off those landing rights, so one airline can fly the route. Big Air is willing to pay up to 300 for it, let's imagine. But maybe American Airlines is willing to pay 300 as well, and maybe United is also willing to pay 300. They can all see you can make a lot of money being the monopolist here. Now the government puts it out to bid. Of course, it might not do that explicitly, it might be Let's see who can curry favor with the politicians. In that case, the money will really be wasted. Big Air might jump into the fray and spend 100 whining and dining and trying to pay off politicians. But United is not far behind, and it bids 200. And then perhaps American Airlines goes for broke and bids 250. It'll only make 50 if it gets the landing rights because it's going to make 300 and has now spent 250. But from a point of view of Big Air, which has already invested, we might say, 100, it pays to invest another 250. That is, even though it will have spent 350 altogether and lose money on the deal, right now it's going to lose 100 and have nothing to show for it. So it might be willing to throw in another 250 to make the 300. Well, following that logic, we can see that if Big Air does that and actually gets the landing rights, Big Air will have spent 350 in order to make 300, and American Airlines will have wasted money, and United Airlines will have wasted money, and the overall rent seeking can really be quite large. I guess the problem could be even worse. It could be trebled. Politicians might change things. Maybe the government knows that really the best way to run the Guardia is to have three competing airlines. But in its quest to get all this whining and dining and campaign contributions, the government might inefficiently set up LaGuardia only to handle one airline in order to get rent seeking from the airlines. So you see how monopolies in the structure of government begin to fit together. The monopolist gets to make more money once it's a monopoly. But in order to be a monopoly, it often needs the government's help. And in turn, the government might sometimes need the monopoly in order to fuel the politicians and their preferences. This is the very unhappy side of monopoly. I hope you're beginning to see what a seamless web is, this thing we call economics. We started out with prices, and the prices were the little messengers that ran back and forth coordinating supply and demand. We saw that competition was what happened in the market to create these exchanges. Then we introduced the idea of a monopolist. The monopolist had a market to himself. He was the only one selling the thing, and he could sell the item at a higher price by cutting back on the output, albeit by creating deadweight loss so that there were people whose demand was unsatisfied, even though they wanted to pay a price that the earth could supply the good for. That was the bad side of monopoly. We also saw that there might be a good side to monopoly. The government might want monopolies to create incentives for innovators. The government might want a monopoly to spread the letters around through the Postal Service. The government in the beginning was seen as the good player that tried to figure out where monopolies were good and where monopolies were bad. Then we introduced complexity and saw, well, the government might not be such a good player. The government might like some monopolies and have an interest in this rent-seeking, in this play by the monopolist to get in a position where they could charge these high prices and keep up barriers to entry that would keep out lower price competitors. In that case, the government is not the solution, but part of the problem. So we have a sort of complex mix where everything we see in government, in monopoly, in competition, and prices begins to interact with one another. In the internet age, things have turned around a little bit. We begin to appreciate the good sides of monopoly as well. First of all, we live in a global world. It's harder to be a monopolist of most goods because goods can be transported from other countries. You don't just need a monopoly in Washington or in your state capital. You need a worldwide monopoly unless the good is very, very heavy to transport. And so there's more competition from abroad. If we see Windows 7 having a great market share, we immediately think, hmm, I wonder if there'll be competition from China. Whereas 50 years ago, people would have seen 
a typewriter come out and they would have thought, oh, this is really a bad monopoly because it'll be very expensive to bring in Italian typewriters. So in a global world, we're less concerned about traditional monopolies, perhaps a little bit more interested in intellectual property and those kinds of monopolies, and we're looking to see where the new competition might come from. Think about prices in a global economy. How, how do we know where to get things from? Why is iPad outsourced to China? Again, it's prices that are traveling the globe. Apple wants a component. It tries to figure out who can make that most cheaply. The component can be made most cheaply in one location. People will pay more for the iPad in another location. The prices race back and forth faster than the iPad. And the iPad eventually finds its way from the maker to the end user. But prices are therefore a way to think about countries and their role in the world economy. Think in this case about your future, where India and China are the growing economic powers of the day. And think how different those economies are and how they rely on monopoly, rent-seeking, and prices. It's a good example for us of things that we've learned. Let's take the case of China first. China is not outwardly a capitalist economy, though it has a lot of capitalism in it. It brilliantly uses local governments in competition with one another. So local government officials want to be promoted. They want to make it to the central committee. They want to get more payments. They do this by showing that in their region of the country, standards of living are rising. People are safer. There aren't a lot of deaths from earthquakes or industrial accidents and so forth. Competition among local governments seems to be the key of what makes China work. Prices help China interact with the rest of the world. But within China, power relationships and competition seems to be what makes it work. It's a top-down economy in a way where people at the grassroots are operating in order to advance in power and wealth. India is a very, very different kind of economy. In the Indian economy, the government famously has trouble producing infrastructure. So there are many cities in India where upper middle class people and certainly wealthy people are paying for health, education, even water in the private market. There's nominally a government supplied system, but then there's a very now well-developed grassroots system where entrepreneurs step in where government fails and entrepreneurs offer goods. In that kind of system, prices play a key role. If I want water and I want clean water, I go see who provides the water best. In China, if I want water and the water's bad, I hold a strike and I complain and then the media pick up on it and the local government official is embarrassed and says, oh, people here have unrest. Unrest is a terrible thing. And before the local official can be slapped out of position by the central party, the local official has an incentive to supply water better and improve the infrastructure. India, prices and markets. China, power, rent-seeking, monopoly, competition among these monopolies, the government comparing them one to another. We don't know which works better. China takes your breath away if you're an economist. If you're an economist in my generation, you were brought up thinking, that central planning fails, only markets can do the job, and only prices as messengers are running around. That's the only way to make the world go faster. And now suddenly we find that our major economic competitor is really only using prices modestly, and instead of using non-price things, including power structures and promotions, to fuel the economy. And they're not bad at it. There are roads in China and factories and railroads and gas supplies, fantastic. And bridges go up and buildings go up quickly. And they're not going up quickly because of little prices running around as messengers. They're going up quickly because a very clever government that has thought about rent seeking and thought about how to eliminate corruption and whining and dining has tried to figure out how to get people to compete that the buildings there will go up faster, better, and safer than the buildings over there. It's a very, very impressive feat. And it's a big challenge for economics in your generation. Economics is now a tool for you. Economics is the way you're going to improve the world around you. Economics is the way you're going to understand your cell phone carrier and why taxis cost what they do and why drinking straws are free, why they supply them with some drinks and not others. You're going to understand travel better and the world better and foreign affairs better. Go learn more about it. Go understand the world about you and go make it a better place. Thank you very much and good luck.